Self-Development with Tactics. Another day, another recording, and actually another day of getting quite some sleep, to be honest. Which actually feels pretty good, I... I you know, even though it is Wednesday, tomorrow's gonna be Thursday, I don't necessarily feel like dying, which is, um, you know, quite normal for me, you know, when it's the end of the week that I... You know, feel incredibly bad, but um, but yeah, you know, it is amazing <laughs> what sleep can do to you, and also, you know, eating enough and and being conscious about what you're doing in a day, you know, and, and not trying to, you know, you know, kind of change the world in a day, you know, by just giving it your all, quote unquote. Well, yeah, um while neglecting to see that this is just not sustainable and not smart at all, you know, and therefore one shouldn't be doing it as well. Anyway, um, let's actually go through another article by the howtobeastoic.wordpress.com site. I think it is an amazing site, I gotta be honest, and not necessarily because it is about stoicism but because it covers certain things and certain thoughts and certain topics that I find highly 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 interesting so let's actually have a look what we can uh what we can say about science because there is actually a science section and the first one being stoic should be vegetarian while um showing a picture of Giuseppe Arcimpoldo, who is an artist, an amazing artist, um, making things, well, actually painting things, and in these paintings, he, um, he shows stuff, for example, you know, quite famous people of that time, uh, but using fruits and, and vegetables and other stuff, you know, which is actually, you know, pretty amazing, his work, but anyway. Stoicism, stoicism and mental health, no, let's see, no, I've already went through this one, stoicism and climate change, stoic astronomy, philosophy versus rationality versus therapy, stoicism and medicine, Epictetus was right, modern cognitive science supports the stoic's conception of emotions, stoic natural philosophy, you know, should I actually go through an article of this? Well, it's actually history and biographies. Um, I totally enjoy biographies. I find them extremely amazing. Nobody expects the Stoic opposition. Stoicism invented here. A simple Stoic timeline. No. <laughs> Stoic role models. Ulysses in Seneca and Dante and the difference between... Uh, curiositas and studiositas. Odysseus and the Epicureans. Let's actually have a look at that. Um, what was the other one? Stoic role models Ulysses in Seneca and Dante. Well, no, let's actually talk about Odysseus for Odysseus and the Epicureans. Odysseus was one of the classic role models for the Stoics and he was my favorite mythological hero when I was a kid. Both excellent reasons for their miniseries on the legendary Greek hero and how he has been interpreted through the lenses of a number of Hellenistic philosophies, including Epicureans and also Stoics and so on and so forth. These notes are based on my reading of the excellent From Villain to Hero, Odysseus, could it actually be that it is Odysseus? In Asian Thought by Sylvia Montilio. We have looked at how the cynics and the Stoics tackled the question of 
Odysseus, and it is now the turn of the Epicureans. I'm skipping Montilius' treatment of the Platonists, but I will conclude next time with a jump forward in time to Dante's take on uh, Ulysses in the Divine Comedy, where Cato the Younger, another stoic role model, is also featured as the only pagan outside of hell. Montelio begins the chapter with Heraclitus' famous accusation that Epicurus used Odysseus' praise of feasting and signing to further his nefarious philosophy. And there's a quote. What Odysseus said falsely, unwisely and hypocritically at the court of Alcinous, Epicurus pronounces as the goal of life and claims to be speaking the truth. But this doesn't mean... Or this doesn't make much sense once we consider that the Epicureans' praise of pleasure was not at all concerned with feasting and singing as if there were no tomorrow. The kind of pleasure Epicurus deems to end of life is a permanent repose of the mind, and then in brackets, catastematic pleasure, not the enjoyment derived from pleasurable activities, which is the kinematic pleasure. So... Epicureans' praise of pleasure was not at all concerned with feasting and singing as if, uh, as if there were no tomorrow. The kind, and this by the way is a quote, of pleasure Epicurus deems the end of life is a permanent repose of the mind. So the catastematic pleasure, not kinematic pleasure, which is being, you know, pleasure deriving from pleasurable activities, drinking, sex, whatever it might be. Indeed, until you adds uh, the only Epicurean author of which we have inherited a direct treatment of Odysseus is the Syrian Philodemus, who actually mocks the Greek hero for his bottomless belly. By disassociating the Epicurean value system from Odysseus' parasitic hunger, uh, Philodemus strongly suggests that uh, Odysseus' supposed hedonism was targeted by opponents of Epicureanism as evidence for the shamefulness, quote-unquote, of that doctrine, rather than being exploited by the Epicureans themselves to defend it. Turns out it is the Stoic Seneca who probably correctly described describe the Epicurean take on Odysseus' stories uh, when he pointed out that the Epicureans praised, and this is a quote, praised the condition of a state at peace, and that treatment of the episode in which Odysseus arrives in the country of the Phaeacians. Indeed, and the same Philodemus mentioned above wrote on the good king where he criticizes the uh, Phaeacians as luxurious, quote-unquote, thus again rejecting the image of Epicureans as hedonists, but praises them for their rigorous physical training and the consequent securing of peace. And Odysseus is like, linked, I'm sorry, uh, likened to them at, and in particular to their king Alcinous, because he too was physically vigorous and presided over a peaceful kingdom. All of this makes sense for Montilio, because Philodemus was writing within the historical context of the late Rome or Roman Republican period in the midst of civil war. So there's a quote. Uh, Philodemus made his treat, uh, what treatise appealing to the Roman elite by avoiding any reference to a specific political contingency and by drawing his examples from the Homeric world, whose multiple rulers could be proposed as models to a Roman aristocrat less offensively than a single monarch. Of all the Homeric heroes, Odysseus was the most suitable to embody the ideal ruler in this context because he was not the king of kings, but a primus inter pares, as it were, and the most effective and cooperative of all his peers. Philodemus in turn influenced a young Virgil, whom he knew personally and consequently Virgil's picture of Ulysses in the Aeneids is Montilio claims less negative than it is often assumed. Philodemus praised, praises Odysseus for the firm intervention he makes in the Liat or Liat to restore order to the Greek camp, thus helping to secure Agamemnon's imperiled leadership. 
This very much appealed to Virgil, who wrote his poem within the context of the Pax Romana, imposed by the first emperor, uh, Octavian, or Octavian, Augustus, or Augustus, whatever. It's probably Octavian Augustus, I guess. Well, in On the Good King, Philodemus and Epicurean praises Odysseus for not claiming to be better than the heroes of earlier times, in contrast with Hector's prideful defiance of the gods. Odysseus also corrected Achilles for both his anger against Agam Agamemnon and his excessive grief over Patroclus. His appeal to moderation in mourning uh, or mourning is proverbial and would have been appreciated by the Stoics as well. His appeal to moderation in mourning. I don't know what mourning is. And I don't even know how to pronounce it either. Grief for sorrow over lament for weep for. So moderation in grief. And you know, probably also complaining, which yeah indeed is appreciated by Stoics, you know. Both Plutarch, uh, Middle Platonist, not an Epicurean, and Philodemus, moreover, a proof of Odysseus' reassurance of his companions when there's what? When they are steering their ship near the monster Charybdis. At first glance, it may appear that the hero is uh, vaingloriously, vaingloriously boasting of the wit that got him and his shipmates out of trouble in the episode of the Cyclope Polyphemus, but, quote unquote, this kind of self praise belongs to a man who offers his virtue and knowledge to his friends as security to lift their spirit. For a critical moment, for at critical moments, an important element for success is the respect and confidence placed in a man who has the experience and abilities of a leader. Odysseus, that is, is boasting for the practical purpose of injecting courage in his crew, not out of vain pride. Moreover, for the Epicureans, it was also important that Odysseus was praising intellectual, not merely physical talent since the emphasis on the former is what distinguished the sect from that of the Cyrenaics, Cyrenaics, or whatever. Um, you know, kind of, kind of a side note by me, just makes sense to praise people, first of all, and second of all, for things they're good at, and they have done well, even though it always depends on well, your values and, and what you're basing that on. I mean, of course, if you honor or um, praise somebody's physical appearance, then apparently physical appearance is something that is important to you and of importance to you. And on the other hand, if you're just praising their, just, by the way, just their intellectual capabilities or, you know, whatever we're talking about, then apparently... Intellect is of importance to you, you know, but by doing both, you kind of acknowledge that both things are important to you and it just makes sense to praise, you know, it just makes sense to say that somebody did something in a good way or somebody did a good job when they also did so. Very often we only hear things that we haven't done well and or we haven't done in a good way, but people really do not often get praised, which, you know, is, is really a pity, to be honest, you know, very, very unfortunate, because it makes people's lives, I think, easier and, and better, you know, just being praised, especially when it is a person that you're looking up to, and or at least a person that has something to say, in terms of, you know, maybe your boss, even if you might not be looking up to your boss as a person or as a worker or as whatever, this person is still above you in, in hierarchy, you know, in the corporate hierarchy. And so it is probably going to be something that you like to hear, you know. I mean, obviously, there's always going to be some bosses that um, when they're saying something good to you and they're praising you for forever, you know, for, for something you did, then you might think, well, yeah, you know, I don't give a fuck about him praising me or her praising me because 
I know that she's not knowledgeable in the space. You know, I know that she's not a good boss and, you know, various different factors. But I do want to underline, please praise people. You know, play, praise the people around you, those that do a good job, those that impress you, you know, by whatever reason. Anyway, long story short, praise. As... Montilio writes, this preference for mental qualities over physical ones, even on the battlefield, resonates with the Socratic tradition, especially with uh, Antithenes, what? Antithenes, who reconfigured the very notion based on Odysseus' intelligence against Ajax's brutish force. In an quote-unquote interlude within a chapter, Montilio seeks to explain why Philodemus presents Odysseus to his fellow Romans not as an impossible ideal as Socrates, what? Well, as Socrates, as Socrates say, but rather a practical model of political virtue. Throughout the Homeric poems, Odysseus acknowledges that mutability of human affairs and braves whatever fate throws at him in the best way he can. Again, in the episode of his visit to the island of Faearikan, whatever, his passion shines through. And there's a quote, This picture of Odysseus accords with the humane sympathy he shows for his victims already in the Odyssey. At the court of Alcinous, he asked the bards to sing of the ruse of the wooden house, a horse, his major feet in the wall. His response to the song is poignant and disquieting. He weeps like a woman who clings to her dying husband while the enemy drags her into slavery. As many a reader has seen, by means of this smile, Odysseus is portrayed in the act of identifying with the victim of her of the war he won, especially the weakest ones, the Trojan woman doomed to be enslaved, the celebration of his major achievement in the war draws tears of empathy from him. He feels no joy or pride. End of quote. Six me, well, let me see how long I've been recording now. I guess it's like 10 minutes or something. Not that long, maybe 12. 17 minutes, well... I wouldn't have said so. Um, let's actually finish up with this paragraph. And I do really hope that I'm... Ah, oh, fuck. Well, yeah, anyway. Um, there's actually really not that much to go. But I feel like ending the episode. I think it doesn't make any sense to end it. Or, you know, go ahead. Even though I don't feel like it. It's probably not going to make things better. Anyway. I wish you the best. Please stay safe. And I hope we'll see you next time. So, bye-bye.